Today, we're going to start building this beautiful steamer trunk. Now today, we have a very special project planned for you. It's a steamer trunk, but it's not just any steamer trunk. This particular trunk is being built with a very specific purpose in mind. Uh, requires a little bit of um, backstory. About a week ago, I was contacted by a gentleman named Dwayne. And Dwayne, unfortunately, was recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And as he's going through his treatments and he's thinking about his future, he really wants to build something special for his daughters. Uh, he has a few boys too, I think, and he's going to build other things for them. But he wants to build either a hope chest or a steamer trunk, something, and asked for my advice where he could go to find some information on it. Uh, he has a limited set of tools, so he wants something that's relatively simple to build. And, you know, I, I thought about it for a while and I just couldn't come up with a way to help him that would do this situation any justice. Uh, you know, just answering a few emails and maybe pointing him to a plan was about all I could think to do. And, then all of a sudden it hit me. Uh, the one, one of the most powerful things about what we do here is the ability to change on the fly. There's no reason why I can't just halt production on everything that I'm working on and start building a steamer trunk and show Dwayne uh, the processes using this video. So that's exactly what this is. I'm building this trunk specifically to show Dwayne how this is done and some of the intricacies of this particular plan. Now the plan that we're using is the steamer trunk woodworking plan from Rockler. This is the one that he picked out. We're going to make a few modifications to simplify it a little bit and make some changes that I honestly think make it look a little bit better. So we'll get to that when the time comes. But if you're interested in this plan, I'll definitely put a link in the show notes and you could follow along. And if you want to help Dwayne out too, feel free to join the Wood Whisperer forum and everybody's kind of pitching in there if uh, Dwayne has any questions as he goes through this process. And there's already a few people who are going to build along with us. So uh, let's dig into these plans since we've never really done a commercial plan on the show before. And uh, well, we'll see what we're in for. Now a plan like this can be information overload. Um, you know, unfold it and you'll see in this small space here, there is everything I could possibly need to know about this project, including a cut list, some diagrams and detailed pictures. That's all very good, but the problem is when you first unfold this and that's what you see, it's very intimidating. So it's important to look at the project, step away from the plan for a second, look at the final pictures of the project, and in your mind, break it into its parts. Okay, we have two identical sides, we have a front and a back, and we have a lid. The corners are made from separate pieces um, that fit into the whole frame's structure. So it's actually not that difficult, but again, when you see it in this big giant uh, poster-sized piece of paper, all of a sudden, it's information overload. So once you do that, and once you have a good idea of the overall structure, then you can get into the details. And I always recommend reading through the plan, at least once or twice. Go through it, make sure you see all the different details because you don't want to do something in the beginning that kind of screws you up, you know, five steps later. A lot of times you'll get to that point later and go, oh, if I only knew this before, I would have cut that part at the same time as I cut those other parts. So that's why having a, a good perspective of the entire project is, is pretty important. Now let's talk a little bit about modifications. Now just because you have a commercial plan doesn't mean you have to stick to every little detail in there. Have fun with it. You know, think of uh, different ways that you might be able to modify the plan to make it suit your personal taste. Just make sure that any changes you make, you think all the way through to the end of the project so you know how they're going to affect things downstream. Now for this particular project, what we're going to do is change the top. Instead of that arched curved top, we're going to make one that's nice and flat and squared off. Now, Dwayne doesn't have a whole lot of tools and he doesn't have a whole lot of time, so something like this really simplifies it for him. And honestly, for me, I just like the look of the square top better. Now, the other change is the wood itself. The plan calls for riffs on red oak and also red oak uh, plywood. Now, I'm doing everything out of solid wood, and I'm going to use quarter sawn white oak to do everything. Now, the panels, I'll have to make sure they have a little bit of room to breathe because they're solid wood. They're going to expand and contract. That should be no problem. But it is quarter sawn wood, so the movement is going to be to a minimum. Uh, and, you know, I just kind of like the idea of building it out of a really heavy-duty, 
you know, uh, something that has a natural weather resistance like white oak does. Um, you know, it, it's going to go into a bedroom most likely, right? Uh, but it's fun to think of, you know, sort of romanticize where this piece may have gone, you know, years ago. If it was going on a ship and on a long voyage, you would want it to be made out of some sort of a heavy duty wood that's going to take a beating because essentially, this was your luggage at that time. So kind of fun to think about, but I've got some beautiful eight quarter white oak here, quarter sawn white oak with some beautiful ray flex in it. And I had to cut it all down to four quarter material. Um, all of the project primarily calls for four quarter and of course uh, quarter inch material for the panels. So I'm not gonna show you that whole process. It really, it was just a bunch of resawing to get these big blocks down uh, you know, to the appropriate thickness like so. Uh, as far as the milling process goes, we have reviewed that in the past. Go back to episode six, the joiners jumping, if you want a review of basic jointing and planing and getting you know, a board that's uh, milled perfectly square, perfectly flat and parallel. Now most of my material is cut to rough size and now what I want to do is mill it down to the right thickness. Now all of the rails and pretty much all of the structural components of this piece are three quarters of an inch. So it's a good idea for me to mill all of those parts down to three quarters of an inch all at the same time. So there's absolutely no ambiguity about the thickness of the material and it's consistent all the way through the project. Now, another thing to keep in mind, if your wood starts to move a little bit when you cut it, and by this point, you probably know that, this particular batch, I gotta tell you, is moving on me a little bit. You know, stuff like that can happen uh, because of improper drying techniques. It might even because, be because of the way the tree grew uh, and the trunk may have been leaning, so you get what's called reaction wood. Either way, if there's a slight amount of movement as you cut it, you want to prepare for that. So let's say I mill this board down to three quarters of an inch, and it's perfect, exactly where I want it. And then I go to slice it in half because I want to get two pieces out of this. Well, two things can happen. The board can start to bow a little bit and spread out this way, or close in on itself as I cut it. But also, the board, once I release it from the center, the board can warp in this orientation as well. And I've already done my jointing and my planing. So that means if I want to get this board dead flat, I've got to now go less than three quarters. So if you suspect that your wood is uh, either reaction wood or what they call case hardened wood, if it hasn't been dried properly, if you suspect that and there's a slight amount of that, you may want to do this rip first before I thickness it. And this way, if it moves at all, I could do the thicknessing later, flatten it out, and then bring it down to three quarters of an inch, and then do my final trim on the table saw. And since I know this stuff is giving me a little bit of a problem, I'm going to go ahead and do it that way. I rough cut the boards on the table saw, giving me my two leg halves. I then joint one face, and one edge. Then I clean the other face on the planer. And now I can cut the parts to final length. I trim one end nice and square, and then flip the piece around, drop my stop block, and cut the other side. Now even though we're using a plan for this project, our role and sort of responsibility as craftsmen is to bring the human element into it, to be able to, to look at these pieces and decide which pieces look best in a certain area. So here's a great example. The front, I guess you can call them legs, basically the front corner pieces are constructed from two separate pieces and they join at a 90 degree angle and that creates the front corner, while well, also the back corner and, and uh, each one of the corners. So what I'm doing is cutting those pieces from a single piece of wood. So let's say I would cut this one here, turn the piece 90 degrees and connect those two together, that would make one of the corners. Now the cool thing about that is the grain patterns will match up and it's gonna look really good that way. But the one thing you wanna really pay attention to here, especially with quarter sawn white oak, is which side actually has the best ray fleck pattern. And that's the reason we're using quarter sawn white oak is because of that ray fleck pattern. So in particular, this one has a stronger, uh, what I consider a more pleasing fleck pattern on the right hand side. So that's what I want to face in the front. So it's important that I designate, and I usually use my end grain to do that, which one is gonna be the front. So I wanna cut it here, this piece, which still looks pretty decent. My dogs are saying hi. This piece still looks decent. So I'm gonna turn that 90 degrees and keep this in the front. Okay, that covers the left side. You know, it's never too early to start labeling your stuff and dedicating it to a certain part of the project. Okay, so for the right-hand side, 
I want this one. This has a little bit more of a distinct pattern on the left side of the board. So I would cut it here and flip this piece around 90 degrees to the side and this becomes the prominent front face. Okay, so the idea is just, you know, to raise your awareness that even though this is just a plan, that doesn't mean that we can't make an, an, an exceptional piece by arranging the grain in the most pleasing way possible. Now let's focus on the legs first, or what would be sort of the corner posts. They're gonna be constructed from two separate pieces. Now the plan calls for you to cut a bevel, a 45 degree bevel into each piece and put that miter together with a spline that runs all the way down. There's nothing wrong with that technique, but I think there's a simpler way that we can do this and I think that's gonna help Dwayne get this job done a lot faster. And that's to do a reinforced rabbit on each of these joints. So instead of just putting the two pieces together and have two equal sized pieces, what we're gonna do is have one piece cut at two inches wide and another piece cut at one and three quarters. And the reason for that is I'm gonna give a rabbit to the two inch piece. And when you put these two pieces together, what you wind up with is the, the size that we wanted in the first place, two inches by two inches. And really, as far as it looks, I think this looks great. And if the grain is matched properly, as we discussed earlier, the grain will sort of wrap around and that little one quarter inch strip won't really make that much of a difference visually. Uh, and it'll be perfectly strong. So. Uh, this is where we're going to start. So the first thing we need to do is make this rabbit over at the table saw. So I'm going to use the dado blade on the table saw to make this cut. You certainly could use a router and a straight bit and that would work just fine. So let me show you the setup here. What I've got is an auxiliary fence set up. Okay, and this could just be any piece of scrap wood. I just happen to have the ultra high molecular weight plastic strip, basically the same thing that's already on my fence. And I use that as an auxiliary fence. Now, when you put one of these on for the first time, you wanna clamp it to the fence, make sure it's nice and secure. With the blade all the way down, turn the saw on. And then slowly but surely bring it up and you wanna basically create an alcove in this piece that allows the blade to sort of nest in there. And the reason we do that is because on a cut like this, we need that blade to be all the way to our outside edge. And if we don't have an auxiliary fence there, that blade is gonna contact our good fence and we don't want that to happen. It'll mar the surface. Probably will be pretty dangerous too. So uh, the auxiliary fence allows us to bury the blade and make sure that we get a perfect cut. So if what we want is a three quarter inch wide rabbit here, we need a dado stack that's actually bigger than three quarters of an inch because some of that's gonna be buried in the auxiliary fence. So it really doesn't matter exactly what number you pick as long as it's greater than three quarters of an inch and then we could fine tune the setting. And the, uh, the rabbit is gonna be a half inch deep and that's a lot of material to remove, especially in something as dense as white oak. So I'm actually gonna do this in two passes. The first pass I'll do at a, roughly a quarter inch. I'll run all my pieces through, then I'll raise it back up to the final height and then run all three pieces, or I'm sorry, all four pieces through afterwards. And that should give me a pretty clean cut and minimize the risk of any sort of kickback. Now with our rabbits done, we could start to turn our attention to the grooves. Now the grooves not only go in these pieces, but just about every other rail uh, in this project has some kind of a groove. And some of them even have two, one on the top and bottom. So let's head over to the assembly table and we'll kind of lay it all out and I'll show you exactly what we're gonna do next. Now, even though it's early in the building process, we have some really critical decisions to make right now. Now, first of all, we have to decide what board is gonna go where and make sure we write on it and indicate you know, exactly what it is so that we don't lose track of it. For instance, the top rail. Well, the top rail is only gonna have one groove that goes all the way across. The middle rail, on the other hand, has a groove that goes on both sides. So we need to make sure each board is labeled appropriately. Now, as part of that, and what I hope you're doing with every project that you do, is you look beyond just, just the obvious, that we've got a, a collection of boards and we're gonna glue them together to make something. What we actually have is a bunch of individual boards, each one telling some sort of a story with its grain. And hopefully you'll be able to develop an eye that, that allows you to put grain next to each other that looks complementary and that looks good. Uh, if you have a certain type of grain on the left side of the piece, you wanna make sure you balance that with a similar type of grain on the right side of the piece. If you have two panels on uh, two doors next to each other, you don't want those to be drastically different because it's just gonna look funny and it's gonna distract the eye. So even at this stage with something like a steamer trunk, we can really take this project from just being, oh, that's really nice to wow. There's just something fluid about it. There's something that just works. And a lot of times it's positioning of the grain that does that. So what I'm gonna do, so I've got my long rail boards here, uh, three for the front, three for the back. And I'm gonna look very closely at these and I'm not sure how much the camera is gonna pick up, 
with the subtle differences between these boards. But just know that what I'm looking for is the Rayflect pattern, and I'm trying to get the best boards to go in the front. And one that just looks like they, you know, a set of boards that look like they belong together. And the stuff that's not so great can go in the back because you're not gonna see it as often. Now these two boards have a very similar background grain. They both have very sort of outspoken Rayflex. I think these will definitely go together. And because of those strong Rayflex, that's really something I'm gonna want in the front of the, uh, the piece. Now you turn this over, and this one, well, there's a, there's a lot of Rayflex, but it's a more regular pattern. Uh, more of a striped effect, which doesn't necessarily look good with the more random effect that I have on this board and on this side. And this has a little bit more of the striping, but it's not quite as regular as you see on that side. So these two look like they want to be together. This one is another sort of random board with uh, it's a good amount of Rayflex in there, big chunky ones. Okay, and this side is not as good. So this is a candidate to go with these other two over here. These three, at least on this side, these are all relatively boring. There's a little bit of Rayflex in them, very small striping pattern, but I don't see anything that really jumps out at me. So I think these three are gonna wind up going together in the back. Now that one actually is pretty impressive. In fact, this one looks like a close brother to this guy right here. So I think that's gonna be it. These three have a real wild, sort of random, outspoken fleck pattern. These are gonna be my three that go in the front. So I'm gonna label them top, middle, bottom, and each one gets an F to indicate front. Now on the side rails, there's not as much fleck to look at here. Um, there's some in there. It, you know, when it's finished, it'll come out even better. But what I'm really noticing here is the grain spacing, basically what would be the space between the growth rings. These two boards are pretty wide and they get tighter in this board, tighter in this board. This one gets a little bit wider, but this one is wider than all of them, in fact. So because of the grain tightness, what I'm gonna do is put this guy with these two. So if you're looking at one side alone by itself, you won't see this side, that's all the way on the other side of the trunk. This side, you, you see like an even grain pattern across those three. And these three also look like they belong together. So it'll make a big difference in the final product. Now, if you can't get all of your boards to match up, it's not the end of the world. I mean, the fact that you just brought that level of awareness to the project is a sign of your growth as a woodworker. And in future projects, you'll be able to pick the wood out at the lumber supplier with that in mind and say, you know what, this would be perfect with this. And you sort of pull things together uh, at an even earlier stage in the project. So if it's not absolutely perfect, don't worry about it, just move on. But you're bringing that extra level of awareness that makes your stuff that much better. Now, just because I know myself all too well, and I know I have a tendency to screw these things up, I'm gonna use a Sharpie just to sort of give myself a visual indicator on exactly where those grooves are gonna go. Uh, this is the bottom piece for one of the side rails. Okay, so I know I'm gonna have a groove somewhere in there, okay? The middle piece gets a groove on both sides. And the top piece gets a groove on its underside. All right, so there's one more modification that we're gonna make to the corner assemblies. The plan calls for a groove on this inside edge on both pieces that stops just short of the top, about a half inch. Uh, what we're gonna do instead is cut that groove the same way all the other pieces are gonna be cut and put it all the way through. Now that'll come back again later. We'll talk about it one more time when we're cutting the uh, tongue on the rail piece because now that has to be a tongue that goes all the way up to the edge. But again, I'll remind you of that later. But this really does simplify things. It makes the process a lot faster. Now to make all of our grooves, I have my dado blade installed and it's set to about a quarter of an inch. And the trick here is to roughly center it by eye and then run the workpiece over once, flip it around 180 degrees and run it over a second time. And what that does is if you were slightly off centered in your setup, it's gonna make sure that you get a perfectly centered groove all the way down. Now that works fine because we're making our panels fit the groove that we cut now and they'll all have the same width groove in it when, when it's all said and done. And we can adjust our panel size appropriately. 
But if you're using plywood, like the plan calls for, your plywood is going to be a very specific size. So I would definitely recommend getting some scrap pieces that are exactly the same size as your material that you're using for the project and make sure you get that setting done perfectly so that it's perfectly centered and it's the exact width that you need for that panel. The way we're doing it gives us a little bit more flexibility. Now that dado blade is going to be removing a quarter inch wide groove by three eighths of an inch deep. And that's a lot of material again. So it does put a lot of force on that workpiece. So once again, using my favorite push stick here gives me a lot of forward pressure as I push it through. And you wanna be able to push it up against the fence so that you get an accurate, uh, an accurate groove all the way down. The problem is I really don't want my fingers in this area pushing that against the fence. So it's time to use a feather board. Now, over the years, I've collected a number of feather boards. Uh, I have everything from these fancy mag switch ones to the grip tight ones with a big magnet on them, um, all the way to homemade ones that I've made that I use for resawing. So anything that you have like that will work. Uh, but what I'm gonna try is actually a new one that just recently hit the market from mag switch. This is a, it's kind of an interesting unit. It's a dual roller guide and it actually has bearings in here. So why not? I'm just gonna give it a shot. But just know that even the homemade ones are going to work for this purpose. I just like this one because it has a nice tall fence and it should keep the entire piece nice and even up against the uh, table saw fence for me. Two passes will result in a perfectly centered groove. Now to make the tenons, we have a very similar setup to what we had before when we made the rabbits. We've got the auxiliary fence attached to the main fence, and we have our dado blade that's embedded inside the auxiliary fence. Now the big difference here is instead of running the boards across this way, we're making the tenons. So I need something to hold the piece, you know, at the right angle. What I'm going to use is my miter gauge. You'll notice I have the miter gauge outfitted with its own auxiliary fence because when you are running the cross grain across the blade like this, it has a tendency to chip out at the very end. So having a backer board like this prevents that from happening. So basically, it's just one pass on one side, one pass on the other side, and that's it. It doesn't take any more work than that. I would recommend, as always, using some test pieces, though, to make sure you get the exact right size before you go and do an entire batch of boards. Um, so let's jump in and get started. A single pass on each side makes quick work of the tenons. And since the grooves are already cut, now's a good time to mill our panels down to size. Now all my panels are milled to thickness and before I move on to the next step, I really like to make sure that every one of my rails is tested because, you know, there's a natural amount of variability in using our machines that may result in a groove that's not exactly consistent all the way across. And that's exactly what I found in a couple of my rail pieces. So if you look, it goes nice and easy into that side and starts to get tighter and tighter until it gets to the point that I'd have to give it a few good taps to, uh, to seat properly. Now, I don't really want it that tight because I risk splitting it apart. So what I'm gonna do is try to relieve some of the material on that end. Now, you could go back and you could, if you have a drum sander, take a few more passes uh, of your board. The problem with that though, is if I make it loose enough to fit nice and, and snug and, and perfect on this side, what do I do to the other side? I make it downright loose. So what I need to do is really fix the problem. So I guess you could go back to the table saw and you could fix the groove that way. But again, I have to go back and do a whole new setup. So this is one of those cases where a specialty hand tool will actually do this job and do it really, really well and save you a lot of time. So what I'm gonna show you here, let me just make sure I determine, okay, it's this side that has the, the issue. And I'm gonna just put this up in the bench. And what I have here is a side rabbit plane. This is the Veritas model that came out not too long ago. It's a very simple little plane that has two blades on it. And the idea is it's meant to, to simply clean out the inside of a rabbit or a groove like this. It has a little fence on the bottom here that helps you adjust your depth. And then you just loosen this knob on the top and push the blades forward manually to get them in the right position. Very easy to use. Um, and of course, because we have grain issues to contend with, you don't necessarily want to go against the grain while doing this. You could easily 
move it from left or from you know left to right operation depending on which direction you need to go. So let's uh, let's see how this works on this board. So now I have this set to take a very light shaving. Uh, we don't really want to remove a lot of material. We just want to sort of finesse the fit a little bit. Uh, before I get started, gotta bust my thirst. Okay, very, very light shavings. So a very little baby ribbon there, beautiful. And let's see if that did anything. Getting there. Pretty good. 